What was it like to go to school in the Middle Ages? What did they learn? How were they taught? Did they have recess and school lunches in the cafeteria? Were they into sports too, like dodgeball, football, baseball? Did jocks and cheerleaders dominate life in their high schools? These and other questions will be answered right after this. Hi, I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you all about the purpose of education in the Middle Ages, who could be taught and by whom, what subjects were taught, and how students were taught. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe, and that little bell thingy so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. In the 7th century, Irish monks introduced spacing between words, unlike Greek and Roman text. And you see here, this is your typical Greco-Roman text. If you look closely, there are no spacing, not really between words. It's all dependent upon case and the word endings, which meant whether in their libraries, if you want to know more about ancient libraries, you can look at my video on ancient libraries or at home on the battlefield, whatever, they could not read a text silently. They had to read it out loud, at least somewhat out loud maybe a little bit under their breath, blah, 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 in order to work it out. Apparently, word spacing, it just didn't occur to anybody. But in the 7th century, the Irish monks decided for some reason, good knows, goodness knows why, to introduce the word space. And you see it here in this text, the this of very early 7th century Irish uh text and you can see there is space in between the words and what does that mean word spacing means it enables silent reading of text leading to faster reading and comprehension and if you don't believe me take any text any book could be textbook could be geometry arithmetic a novel the newspaper assuming anybody still has newspapers, whatever you think, and read it out loud, a passage. And you will note it takes you longer. I mean, you can read it do a thing. Read it silently and then read it out loud. It'll take you longer to read it, to understand what's being said if you read it out loud. Even if you're somewhat blah, 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 not talking very loud. It just takes you longer. Silent reading is tremendous advance. So you can read far faster and understand far easier. And this simple change was one of the key reasons. There are more than one, but one of the key reasons that enabled educational and intellectual endeavors in the West, in Western Europe, to advance quicker than any previous civilization. In 789, the Emperor Charlemagne, Chuck the Great, if you don't know who he is, check out my video on the Carolingian Age. Charlemagne decreed that schools be established in every monastery and bishopric. That, quote, children can learn to read. That psalms, notation, chant, computation, and grammar be taught. And that teachers be men with the will and the ability to learn and a desire to instruct others, unquote. So schools were established in major cities throughout the empire. This is what we today call the Carolingian Renaissance. 
during which as stability returned in the West due to the efforts largely of Charlemagne and contact was resumed with the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, and the Islamic world, largely in Spain, there was a flowering of literature, art, and architecture. During this Carolingian Renaissance, most of the surviving works of classical Latin that existed in Western Europe were copied by scribes trained in these schools. And they also devised an easier script, which we today call Carolingian Minuscule, which provided a common script across Europe for the first time since the collapse of Rome. You see it here, your typical Greco-Roman script if you look at that earlier picture, the one that didn't have any word spacing, it's all caps. Here, with minuscule, you have a few caps like these that start the word, and the rest are all lowercase. Again, a tremendous advance. You may not be able to understand what the words mean, but it's going to be a lot easier to read this than simply reading nothing but caps all the time. Charlemagne himself took a serious interest in scholarship, promoted the liberal arts at his court, ordering that his children and grandchildren be well educated. And he himself even tried to learn Latin. He didn't do very well at it. He did start very late in life, but he wanted to set an example for not just his children, and grandchildren, but everyone else's children, grandchildren, and all the nobility in his court. So he tried to learn Latin under the noted scholars, this is supposed to be them, Paul the Deacon or Paulus Diaconus, Einhard, and Alcuin of York, three of the really the top intellectuals of his time. The schools established on Charlemagne's orders. And you see here some pictures of them, a typical cathedral school. And here are ooh, some nobility sending their kids off to the school. This kid doesn't look too happy about it. Anyway, the schools established are commonly called, today anyway, cathedral schools. Because they're almost entirely located in the cathedrals. So they're not really out in small parish churches. Only a town or city that has a cathedral. Anyway, what do they teach? Logic, disputation, which is a method of argument, administration, accounting. If you're going to run type, some type of manorial or agricultural establishment, you're going to need to know those, but also canon law. That's C-A-N-O-N. -N. Canon law in this case, meaning church law. It's not about anything that goes boom. At first, these schools, which enrolled no more than 100 students, and this, note, this means this is not mass public education. This is sort of a, an elite, small group, but at least they're trying to learn something. At least these schools enrolled no more than 100 students simply train boys only, so boys only, for a career in the church. So increasingly, of course, if you have a religion based on a book, the Bible, you should be able to have priests who can read the Bible and other commentaries, the works of St. Augustine and St. Greg the Great and Ambrose, St. Jerome and others. So at first, it was only for boys who were thinking about going into the church as priests or maybe as monks. But later, any boy of intelligence could enroll, even serfs, because the church primarily needed educated clerks, and they did not care what status you had in society. And of course, they didn't care what kind of priest, just because you're upper class doesn't mean you're fit to be a priest or because you're a serf that you're not fit to be a priest. They wanted anyone 
who had the calling and could do the job. Now, what were these students taught in these cathedral schools? Well, at first, they had to be taught reading, and then writing, and the Latin. And why Latin? Well, that was the common language of the time, uh, which would have been difficult because most people's native language was not a Romance language based on Latin, uh, especially if you're a Germanic language, but the ones who were a Romance language would not have had that much of a difficulty. Also, psalmody. Psalms, so they could sing the psalms in the church, in the service. And then once you master that, you could then move on to the more difficult seven liberal arts, which were all taught in Latin. And again, since all the texts were in Latin, that is why you needed to know Latin fluently. And the seven liberal arts are grammar, which is grammar for Latin, astronomy, because we need to know at least when Easter shows up. Remember, it's not on a fixed date. Rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, simple arithmetic, geometry, and music, along with scripture and theology. And you see here in this uh, depiction, theology led by the seven liberal arts. Now, there were also monastic schools. They taught the same curriculum. Reading was required by the Benedictine rule. And nearly all monasteries in the West were Benedictine. If you want to know more about that, that's in my video on the regular clergy. So, since reading was required, again, you're going to be able to need to be able to pray Pray from books, make commentary, and certainly be able to read the Bible, for goodness sake. So, Abbey set up schools for their monks, which also taught local boys and sons of the nobility. Remember, this is at a time when most of the nobility, the upper class, do not live in cities. They live out in manor houses, castles maybe, out in the countryside. So, the cathedral schools are in the towns and cities, but not many people are living in these towns and cities, which you can find out again about more about in my uh, video on the Dark Ages. Anyway, but in the countryside, more present were the monasteries. So if you were a serf's son, that's primarily where you would go to school if it was allowed. But the monks, local monks, did try to pressure local parents to send all of their sons at least for one year of schooling. If the kids didn't work out well, they'd send them back to their parents. Now, while girls could not enroll in cathedral schools, Convents did run schools for their nuns, their novices. Along with any local girls, serfs, and free peasants, and daughters of the nobility, who were taught the same subjects as boys in cathedral and monastic schools. Now, while the nuns, since they're not priests, could not say Mass or hear confession and do the sacraments, still, they also prayed and they also needed to know the Bible and other texts, church text, and church law dealing with convents. And they also needed to know something about arithmetic and accounting and geometry to make sure that their male stewards who ran their estates for them were not cheating them. Who would cheat a nun? There's unscrupulous people everywhere. Now, with the collapse of the Carolingian kingdoms under the onslaught of Vikings, Muslims, and Magyars, the literate, document-based culture of the Carolingian Renaissance largely reverted to a Germanic tribal culture, which had characterized the real Dark Ages, the centuries between the fall of the Roman Empire and Charlemagne. This was a culture based on orality and memory. 
And by this I mean all knowledge has to be memorized and it's passed down orally from one person to another. And this means even back then, even at the time of the Romans and really up until sometime in the 20th century, uh, I remember as a boy still having to learn more text by heart, by memory, than today. You memorize a good chunk of your, cult, of your countries, of your regions, cultural knowledge. And it wasn't passed down through books. It was passed down orally. And of course, as a result, this causes new attitudes towards script and written authority. This means that written text ceased to function as the primary means of learning. So books and the words therein took on the guise of fixed utterances of preserved oral speech. Syllables of sound, say, frozen and preserved in script, awaiting but a reader's recital to revive their magic power for the benefit and enjoyment of all within hearing. So books came to be treasured, not so much for the information they contained, but for their intrinsic power as maybe a holy relic, especially of one that contains the Bible or other texts. A battlefield talisman, yes, there were accounts of armies going into battle with a priest or sometimes the local general holding aloft a book, usually a very large book crested with jewels. By this book we shall conquer the Bible at least would make sense, but it, any book would do. It, imagine, I mean, today it'd be, by this economic ledger, we shall win. I guess on Wall Street or the SEC, that would make sense. But by this copy of Beowulf, we shall win the battle. I mean, it's, we don't think that way anymore today. And the books themselves are all kind of magic books. If you ever see one of those animation films where the people read the books and somehow the letters come off the page and start doing things, that's how these early medieval people thought of books and writing. They're physical manifestations of God's power. But during the intellectual revolution of the 12th century, if you don't know about that or aren't familiar with it, don't remember it, it's in my video on the High Middle Ages, all this changed. Slowly to be sure, starting with a literate elite, gradually working its way down to the lowliest European by the mid 20th century, replacing a culture of orality and memory with one based on written documents and literacy. In other words, they start to think like we do today. Back in orality and memory, people didn't quite trust written documents like written contracts because they thought it could easily be changed. What you did trust was a man's uh, oral word. But that's also why you needed witnesses. Witnesses to a contract, witnesses to a marriage, because simply the written thing saying, yes, they were married this time, nobody trusted that, but they would trust witnesses. And nowadays, we find go, we've sort of gone the reverse. We don't quite trust witnesses because, as we know, memory can change. We can rework our memory, especially in terms of bad things. Numerous studies about that. If you want to know more? It's in the, the books recommended by me in the description below. But anyway. Books once more became the prime means of imparting knowledge across and down generations. By the 12th century, things had changed in Europe. And so, in 1179, the Third Lateran Council, one of the church's general councils, decreed that priests should provide a free education to all parish boys, and not just sons of the local nobility, through song and grammar schools. So not just in a cathedral, but any parish. Every parish 
should have a priest who can read. You would think they would. Even by the time of the Reformation, they still had some problems with that, but okay. Anyway, and all parish boys should get it, not just, as I said, sons of the local nobility, but merchant sons, and the merchants increasingly needed to be literate and to know how to do arithmetic and accounting, and even the serfs. The serfs probably don't need as much to know about reading, but if they can learn and they're bright, they can get a good career in the church. And they do it through what are called song and grammar schools today. The method in all of these schools, whether we're talking cathedral, monastic, or convent, and the song and grammar schools is uniformly the same. Wrote memorization. So while they trusted the books of Amor, you still had to memorize quite a lot because there weren't very many books. And books to make them are extremely expensive. You can find out more about it in my video on book production. So rope memorization and drill, which we'll get to shortly. Accompanied by birchings, spankings with a bundle of sticks. You can see that here. Here's the schoolmaster. And this is his birchings and uh, you didn't do right you just lean over and he just smack you on the butt maybe more than once and wearing a donkey head like this for miscreants or the lazy no dunce cap instead you would be mocked by wearing the donkey head as a dunce dumb as a donkey Song schools were the equivalent of modern primary or grammar schools, where children aged 7 to 10 attended for at least the first year. Those thought too stupid or lazy to learn were then washed out and sent home. And of course, you see it here. Here, of course, is the, oh, this is some fights in the playground. And, uh, oh, at least this child. Oh, it looks like he's been injured a bit, but the local uh, priest will take care of him. In song schools, boys were taught elementary reading, singing, and grammar in Latin, as I said before, with perhaps some French. French by the 12th century is becoming the lingua franca of the upper class and basic numbers. But writing was not taught. Yes, today we teach reading and writing together. But back then, starting from this point onwards, they did not teach it together. It was reading or writing. Writing was like calligraphy. It was a specialty. And you might think it'd be tough to know how to read, but if once you can read the script, you can read it. I mean, you may not know how to write it, like in calligraphy, very fancy, but you can recognize it and read it. Again, you see here, oh, this apparently is a lazy or a naughty boy. And here is a schoolmaster with his bundle of birch rods. And he is, this kid's getting a good spanking. Grammar schools were much like a combination junior high and high school. They were only how for smart boys, aged 10 to 15. These were taught more advanced Latin grammar and literature. Remember, everything's Latin, so the more you learn, the better off you are. Along with more advanced arithmetic, we're not up to calculus or our algebra here yet, but not much more advanced French. And they're certainly not being taught their own vernacular language. And again, I uh, see here again, a uh, schoolmaster with the birches, both cases, and hopefully the kid is learning how to read. The result of all this was that by the 14th century, cities and towns across Western Europe had at least 
one song and grammar school. Though there were fewer schools in the countryside. And you can see that here, these are the English schools where they're located. Some of these are cities and towns, but there are some out in the countryside, though Wales is not as blank as we look, or Scotland, that there is no information on them. And this is where they are located in the city of London itself, in the year 1400. By the Reformation, at least half the European population, even serfs, could read. That's a tremendous number. Again, you have this old idea that only monks could read in the Middle Ages. Totally not true. Even serfs and peasants could read. Now, they cannot sign their own name. And that's often where you get this idea that people can't read. If they can't write, they must be illiterate. But remember, reading and writing were separately learned skills. And here is today's wrap-up quote. A little school there stood for Christian boys who learned in that same school. Year after year, such teachings as with men were current there, which is to say, to sing well and to read. Among these children was a little choir boy, seven years of age, who went to school as days passed one by one. This little child, his little lesson learning, sat at his primer in the school and there said, quote, Now truly I will work with diligence to learn it all ere Christmas. Though for my primer I take punishment, and though I'm beaten thrice within the hour, yet will I learn it by Our Lady's power, unquote. Chaucer. Let me know what you think of this topic of this quote in the comments section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos on the Middle Ages. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies, as I mentioned in the text, in the video itself earlier, recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.